Doug Goldstein. Welcome to the Profile CE Institute. I originally started the CE Institute because as a CFP professional, I found that I was always scrambling to try to get my continuing education credits. Now, this isn't to say that I wasn't always continually educating myself. In fact, one of the things that I particularly like about the whole community of certified financial planning professionals is that they're always trying to improve themselves. There's so much discussion going on. We're always attending seminars, and at least for myself, I know I'm always reading, and all of my colleagues are also constantly reading and trying to improve themselves so that they can help their clients. What's the problem? you still have the bureaucratic side of having to report to the CFP board what sort of continuing education you've done so that you can fulfill the requirement. I'm sure that all of us do way more than the 30 hours that are required to actually educate ourselves, but at the end of the day, it's reasonable that the CFP board maintains a certain standard, and therefore we have to enter the credits into their system. So how do you do it? Well, for a lot of us, we've gone to seminars and hope that they've given us credit and that they file the credit, and sometimes, frankly, it doesn't always work out so smoothly, and then we have to follow up with it, or we'll do some sort of self-learning, and we have to pay in order to get that credit registered with the CFP board. So the purpose of the CE Institute was to allow CFPs to get the education for free. In fact, anyone's welcome to get the, take the classes for free. And then if you want to get the credit for it, we have a test, and we do charge a, a nominal fee to process the, the actual test, but it's usually pretty quick. And then we will, once you pass the test, we will then send your CFP credits directly to the CFP board. Another problem that I found with getting the credits that I needed was, depending on what was going on in my life, I could sometimes either go to a seminar, or I'd want to listen to something audio, or I'd watch a video. So in order to solve that problem, we've made all of our classes available as an online video, so it's there 24-7. We've made it something you can read. You can simply download the transcript of the course and read through it, or you can listen to it as an audio. So if you're driving and you want to listen to the class, and then when you get to the office, just take the test, chick chock, and there you go. You've got your credit. By the way, the tests are simply designed to test that you've understood the material. They are not made in such a way as to try to confuse you that you have to constantly go back and see, well, what did he say? We've simply put together some tests to make sure that you've achieved a certain level of mastery over the material, and then we can submit your name to the CFP board. The other thing I'd like to ask, if you enjoy the program and you enjoy this model, please let me know any other topics that you would like to hear about. Also, if there are other people or companies who you think would like to use our platform to give the classes, let me know that as well. We're rather selective, frankly, about who we choose to give the courses because we're trying to maintain a high quality, but I'm very open to, to hearing new ideas. So my email address is doug at ce-institute.com. Again, I'm Doug Goldstein. I'm the president of the CE Institute. And feel free to email me directly, doug at ce-institute.com. Com. I hope you enjoy the course, and good luck on the test. Okay, we are talking with David Litke, who runs a budgeting consulting firm called Bonus Family Budget Counseling. David, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. It's very important as a certified financial planner to be able to coach clients in terms of their budgeting. So tell me, what activity or behavior, maybe more than anything else, is the key to successful home money management? The main uh, characteristic that I look for when I sit with a couple, and also I do a lot of work with young couples, newly married. In fact, I give as a wedding gift to weddings that I'm invited to, I give a two-hour seminar to the young couple on the basics of family budget counseling. It's probably the most valuable gift that they get. I've had, their parents have told me that. They haven't told me that yet, but their parents have. <laughs> <laughs> the parents, perhaps, who, who made 20 or 30 years of, let's say, I won't call them mistakes, but not the maximum, maximally wise decisions. I had one mother just uh, couldn't, couldn't uh, stop gushing about what, what a gift it had been because... If you if they know the rules and uh, immediately I'll get to your to the answer to your question because it's all connected. If they know the rules, uh, they start off their habits uh, much more constructively and healthily, and uh, don't make mistakes that many many young people make because they simply haven't thought these things through and and uh, haven't had life experience. And sometimes when you get the experience, it's very very late to change things. To answer your question, 
communication between the spouses. I've discovered more than anything else that where I had spouses, even those I came to many years later, they're able to have a common language about in their relationship. Then they're also able to find a common language and the communication skills when it comes to talking about money. Uh, there, there are four areas, perhaps, which when a couple is dating, if we are courting and they're thinking about getting married, that they need to talk about and I imagine many times they don't talk about. Three of them are not so related to us, but one is uh, how we're going to raise our children and other is maybe religious practices and another is how we're going to relate to our, to our in-laws and our families when they, when they get in our way. But the main thing perhaps is just uh, talking about money. What kind, of, uh, what kind of financial life do we want to uh, run together? Uh, so if you're going to advise an advisor to help his clients improve their communication, what are some of the steps that, that the advisor can do? Well, first of all, he has to has to have, uh, let's say, good antenna. In other words, he has to be gifted in understanding and reading some of the uh, uh, un unspoken communication that he sees between the couple when he sits down with them. Uh, sometimes it's very, very hard to change the level of uh, communication or the intimacy of the communication between a couple after they've been married a long time. That's why it's so so much easier to start with uh, with younger couples. He needs to emphasize not so much in a uh, financial instructional kind of way, but more in a what might you call a coaching counseling kind of a way. How important it is that they work together on these uh, on, the, on the numbers and on the budgets and on their priorities. And many times uh, there are differences in priorities, and if the pie is only so big. Couples need to be able to communicate with each other to the point that one gives on one category and the other gives on another category, and they're able to preserve the size of the pie and not spend more than the money they make. So you re an advisor really needs to be a good listener and also be a good teacher because at some point, if he finds the opening, he can also share with them the importance of what, of what I've just described. And I, I consider this... The, one of the greatest challenges that I have when I sit down with couples, some of them simply don't have the communication skills because they never had a confront. It also seems that a lot of them, there's one in a lot of. It seems that in a lot of cases there are couples where one of them is the powerful money player and the other one is the passive money player. And as an outsider, it's very easy for me to see that, but to express that problem to them sometimes is earth-shattering. Yeah, yeah, and I want to tell you something. It doesn't always work. I, I've, a, I've counseled about 200 couples, perhaps, in the last couple of years, and I have had three or four cases where when I came into the picture and explained the things that need to be done, I'm talking about people with tremendous financial difficulties and great amounts of debt, when I came and explained the things that need to be done and the communication skills that are required to begin to work on this problem, I'm sorry to report that the there were two or three cases where the couple broke up because wow. the whole issue of having now to confront our our problems, which means confront our relationship and how we deal with our problems, uh, it just blew up in their faces. And um, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I considered retiring from the profession because, thank God, we help many people also. But this is really uh, an, almost an occupational risk for some of them because uh, they just don't know how to communicate. And I like to comfort myself in the fact that if it didn't blow up on the money thing, it might have blown up on something else anyway because there is a tremendous a connection, as I mentioned before, between the ability to communicate, whether it's in money or or any other or any other aspect of life uh, that parents uh, that parents need to uh, talk to each other about. Okay, so you've you've answered the first question I had, which was, what activity is the most important for a couple to be successful in money management? And you said communication. Absolutely. So let's assume that as advisors, we can now help our clients to communicate well, or if not, we can recognize that there's a problem and perhaps send them to a professional who could help them with that. One of the things that I know that you speak about is the importance of periodic planning and review. And as a financial planner, where I try to look at the big picture, I always encourage clients to let me know if there's any changes in their life or at least to do an annual review of their financial plan. 
do you think that it's the same with budgeting, or is there is there a different time frame with this subcategory of financial planning? There is an absolutely different time frame because we're dealing with the kind of detail that uh, the movement of money through our lives happens so quickly over the course of a week or a month that if we don't keep our uh, our finger in the dike, so to speak, and keep tabs on what's going on, things can run away from us. So the time frame I usually deal with is month to month, which means that a couple should sit down before each month begins, uh, late in the month, 28th, 29th of the month, prepare a budget for the next month. If that's their the, if that is the month that they work on, and if people get paid at a different date, they can do it also from the 10th of the month to the 10th of the month. That's not important. And it means sitting down, uh, planning next month's spending, and that is the monthly framework we're talking about. Within the month, there are smaller frameworks, time frameworks, such as a week or biweekly. It's very important for the couple to review within the month how are we doing on the budget, on the plan that we created for this month? A very simple example would be, for example, if they've budgeted X amount of food for the month. Now they come to the midpoint of the month and discover that they've already spent 70% of the food budget. So uh, if they're going to stick within their budget and, and, and keep to their goals, then they have only 30% of the budget left to spend on the second half of the month. Now, they may have had an exceptional case which caused them to spend too much in the first half or they just may have been careless. But if they're responsible now, this is the crunch time for many of the flexible expenses that go on through the month. Now we have to meet our deadline. So the framework would be monthly budget planning and weekly or at the very least biweekly review of how we're doing on our budget. Because if not, things just can run away from you. So this sounds ideal, let's say, for someone like me who happens to be neurotic about money, and it's my profession, so I have to set an example for my clients. But in real life, we all know that most people are not that meticulous, let's say, about anything, let alone being able to watch their money you know, on a week-to-week -week or a month-to-month -month basis. Is this a reasonable expectation to tell a client? <laughs> If somebody's <laughs> having money problems, it's very reasonable to tell them, of course. I'll, I'll take an absurd example. Suppose somebody walked into your house once a week or once a month and just started rifling through your drawers, let's say your fine silver, and took out a couple of uh, knives and forks each week. Uh, you would be, or your wife certainly, would be absolutely furious that they're stealing my silver. Well, why is that different than if I'm not watching my silver, that is to say my money, and I'm not careful through the, through the month where it's going, and I'm, not, uh, and I'm throwing out food, for example, that, I, that we haven't eaten, and I'm not careful watching my bill because the cell phone company is overcharging me, or I'm still paying for insurance that uh, I don't need anymore, why is that different than the guy who walks into your house and steals your, your uh, fancy silver? So the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, to be, it requires being meticulous. Um, I like to tell the story I read in uh, the biography of John D. Rockefeller once where his son came to him. He had found a nickel on the street. He says, Dad, I found a nickel. And uh, Dad says, that's great. Now, what does that nickel mean? What does that represent? And the son went through all sorts of answers that I don't quite remember right now, everything that he tried to answer, but they were all the wrong answers. They were not the answer that his dad wanted to hear. Finally, John D. Rockefeller said to his son, the nickel is the interest on a dollar for a year. So that, that's the matter of being meticulous and understanding that, that every little asset that we have down to, down to the dollars and down to our small, uh, small items in the house and property and things that we need, to take of, we need to take care of, everything has a ramification for our long-term uh, financial health. I can also uh, mention briefly the well-known book by Tom Stanley called The Millionaire Next Door, where he surveyed American millionaires and how they made their money. And um, all of them watch their money. And all of them don't drive fancy cars. 80% drive used cars. So let's talk about this, this reasonable question again. One of the, the models that I myself have advised clients, and I know that you have as well, is to use the envelope system. And like you said, you have this meeting with your spouse. And, and to take it a step further is you actually put the cash into envelopes. 
is this a reasonable system in real life, not just in theory? Reasonable is what is what makes reason and sense to you. If a couple cannot manage their finances well without resorting to a system of meticulous uh, money watching and watching the money in the envelopes, particularly for flexible expenses, where we have leeway how much we're going to spend this month on a particular item, as opposed to, for example, the rent or the mortgage, which is, which is a fixed item. Yes, met the meticulousness is, is very, very important. And it's all a matter of where you also of where you're holding in life. I grant that for many people, this is difficult and maybe perhaps and perhaps unnecessary if, if things are going well in the bank and we're balanced and we don't have debt, nobody's chasing us for bill for unpaid bills, then uh, it might be considered unreasonable. But what's unreasonable in one case is most reasonable or even necessary in another case. And for the people who are struggling and can't make ends meet and they have debt and they don't want to get into worse shape and they want to, in fact, turn lives around, yeah, it's just going with the tweezers Every little place and cleaning up, so to speak, every little piece of dirt when you're trying to clean up something really, really, uh, really small and hard to get to. And it's the same thing with the money. Yeah, going with your with your envelope system and writing everything down and also recording cash expenses because uh, those are that's also where we lose track of a lot of our money. So reasonable is is for one gentleman it is for what it isn't, and a, a lot depends on the client and his financial situation. But it's a it's a tactic that works for so, so many people. If you had to give a general rule about which expenses are best paid with cash and which by credit card or automatic bank transfer, what would you advise? Okay, mostly the fixed expenses would be paid by credit card or, um, or automatic bank transfer. It's a matter of convenience, for example, that if you're paying the mortgage, it's going to come out um, automatically from your uh, bank account or your credit card, depending in different countries, there are different different habits and practices. But in either case, you know that on uh, a particular day of the month, they're going to take out my municipal taxes, they're going to take out my water bill, my electric bill, my mortgage, and my tuition perhaps for my children in school if I, if I pay that, and so-called fixed fixed costs. So as a matter of convenience and perhaps good record keeping, I don't have a problem with people paying by credit card or automatic bank transfer, those kinds of payments. Where I do uh, really, really recommend cash usage and not credit card usage is in flexible expenses, where I have control every month of what I'm going to spend on the flexible items. And these would include food, of course, food and groceries, uh, clothing, entertainment budget, um, spending money for the children, uh, gasoline for the car, all those things I would tend to uh, recommend to spend cash, not credit card, because it makes me think a little more and a little harder before I spend the money um about uh, about the care I'm going to take before I before I uh, distribute my money in all different kinds of places. So if I've got a, a budget uh, sorry a, yeah, a budget envelope for food of let's say a thousand dollars for the month, uh, I know that I'm going to spend only the thousand dollars and when I go to the supermarket, let's say I shop once a week, I'll take 200 or 250 dollars with me. And that's my budget for the food in the supermarket. And I know when I get to the checkout counter, that's all I'm going to spend because that's all I took. If I whip out my credit card at the checkout counter, <laughs> I always say the sky's the limit. Oh, there's this, there's this sale, and suddenly, suddenly, uh, bottled water is uh, on sale. And let's buy, let's buy 40 bottles of water, and stock up our pantry, and that sort of thing. But if it takes me over my budget then that's, that's defeating. So cash for flexible expenses, credit card and or automatic bank transfer for fixed expenses as a rule. I think that's, that's a good explanation of how to deal with it. I've often told clients who have discovered that when they buy their groceries, they actually put it on credit and then only pay their minimum monthly balance on the credit card. And then occasionally they take a home equity line of credit and use that to pay off their credit cards 
And what's the effect of this? And I've described it. I said, listen, remember that steak you ate last week? That steak is something you are now going to be paying off for the next 15 years on your mortgage. And it's long gone. Talk about a depreciating asset. Yeah, well, you know, you're giving me heartburn just uh, just thinking about, <laughs> thinking about this tactic. Uh, let me tell you a little story. When I was uh, uh, first uh, first doing this kind of work after I had finished my uh, course of study, I wanted to buy my wife a gift for her birthday. So I set myself a limit of uh, $200 uh, to buy her a nice set of earrings in a very fancy store. And I went into the store and I had the cash. And I uh, spoke to a lovely young sales girl who was all excited and jumping up and down to help me. What can I help you with? And I told her I'd like to buy my wife some earrings. And this is my budget, $200. She said, oh, wonderful. She put out uh, several sets of earrings, beautiful, beautiful things. I'm sitting there looking at it. And she says, would you like to see a necklace? I said, yeah, sure. I'd like to see a necklace. What do I know? I know what a necklace costs. She whips out some beautiful necklaces. I see one I really like. How much is it? It's $1,000. Wow. I said a thousand dollars, but I told you my budget was two hundred. And so she said, What's the problem? She says, You take it on your credit card, do twelve payments, and here's this the thing she said that set me through the roof, and you won't even feel it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said and she she picked on the wrong on the wrong cookie to say that to a budget counselor to say such a such a statement as you won't even feel it. Right. So I won't I won't uh, say everything I uh, I uh, responded with to her, but I tried <laughs> to explain to her. Of course, I'm going to feel it because you're going to have me pay twelve payments or whatever it is, and the next guy store I go to over to, and then when I buy the groceries and this and everybody I'm going to set on payments in about two and a half to three months. I'm going to be absolutely choking, and I won't be able to breathe because of all the uh, spontaneous, so-called painless decisions I made to use my credit card or buy on credit. So it catches up to you, like you say, very quickly. Actually, one of the tools that I've told clients who are looking to buy a house is I've suggested that when you work in your financial plan, how much you can afford for the house, whether it's with a mortgage or related to the down payment, and then you are going to go meet the real estate agent, you should tell the real estate agent that your maximum price that you are willing to pay for the property is about 30% less than whatever your maximum price actually is. So if you want to buy a million dollar property, you tell the agent, I will pay not a penny more than $700,000. Because the first house they show you is going to be about $850,000. And of course, you're going to want the more expensive house. So if you told them right at the outset that you're limit was a million dollars, you're going to see a $1.2 million house before you know it, and you'll find yourself way over your head. Yeah, yeah, you have to so-called protect yourself with these mental games and tactics, absolutely, uh, to avoid falling into these holes. I, I should say also, when I was at a seminar in the States, I went to a Dave Ramsey uh, sem seminar, counselor seminar in Nashville, um, there was a gentleman there from Czechoslovakia, uh, a counselor. And they asked him, uh, what are you coming here from Czechoslovakia to, uh, to learn about uh, budget counseling? First of all, why do you even need it over there? So he explained, this is about 20 years or so after the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain and the uh, communist world in Eastern Europe. He said, up until 20 years ago, it's true in Czechoslovakia, there was no problem of people getting into debt and, cred and, and uh, credit trouble and requiring counseling. But since the Western culture uh, entered Czechoslovakia over the years, it took a bit of time, of course. We now have the same culture that you have in the West. We have the big shopping centers and, and the big stores and the wonderful advertising. Everywhere you go, they're bombarding you with advertising. And we have people in Czechoslovakia who cannot say no to themselves. You, you know, their eyes get very big and they started buying on credit. And we now have the same kind of credit problem in Czechoslovakia that you've had in the West for many years. If I may add, um, I saw an interview once or, uh, and Jay Leno or some other similar talk show where he was interviewing a very elderly woman and he asked her, what was the absolutely worst invention in the 20th century? And she said, the credit card. No kidding. No kidding. Well, that... <laughs> <laughs>
End of discussion. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about another critical topic that I always build into the overriding financial plan, but I think really has a very strong impact on the day-to-day -day operations of someone's money, which is the importance of an emergency fund. Frequently, clients will say that either it's just too difficult to put aside the money, or they'll note that they don't really need the emergency fund because they can always take some money off their credit card or against their house. So why bother putting three to six months worth of money into a cash account, which doesn't earn anything, or sometimes I even advise clients to have more money in a cash account six to 12 months just because the economy seems a little bit shaky. Right, and if somebody especially loses his job, so how's he going to eat for six to 12 months? Uh, it's extremely important for, uh, but it would have most meaning, it would have most meaning to people who are organized, uh, organized uh, budgeters. If I set up a budget with my spouse for the month, and let's say, for example, that our monthly budget is um, $5,000 for purposes of discussion, I will now take all $5,000, and before the month starts, we'll sit down, we'll plan it, we'll cut up the pie of $5,000, and we'll decide what we're going to spend on every item. And we will have an item in there also for home repairs, for example. Uh, don't know, $250, let's say. Most months, the $250 will suffice. But suppose, for example, the transmission goes on the car, or... Um, the compressor goes on the refrigerator, or some repair that's far above what I budgeted, I have two options. So one you alluded to, of course, was, well, I'll just put it on the credit card, and I'll pay it over 12 months, and I know that I'm going to pay interest on it, but uh, that's one way of dealing with a problem. The other way of dealing with a problem is to have had in place an emergency fund. I'm going to speak... Uh, address momentarily what you mentioned about a three to six or a six to 12 months emergency fund. Right now I'm dealing more with like a small emergency fund of uh, maybe two or three thousand dollars to keep uh, aside for um, for these kind of home repairs. So instead of busting the budget, I go to the emergency fund, take out what I need, pay for the refrigerator repair, and I've done two things. I've protected my budget that is to say, I did not go over my budget. The repair of the refrigerator was not, budget, was not budgeted, yet I covered it without touching my budget. So it's, as I say, an insurance policy for the budget. And the other thing it does is, is really a psychological benefit. It makes what could have been turned what what could have turned into a major crisis. Oh dear, where am I going to find this money? This this thousand dollars. It turns it into a small bump in the road, something that, oh, of course it hurts to spend a 1000 or $2,000 on a repair. But I did it. I didn't break my budget. And now next month, I'll put into my budget a couple of hundred dollars to replenish the emergency fund for the next crisis so that I bring it up to the level that I had it before. So you're talking about the small emergency fund for minor budget busters, as you described it. Let's talk about the case of someone who is a, a high earner. The, the, the couple, let's say, brings home three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year, and they're not necessarily budgeting, but they seem to stay generally afloat. And if they're underwater a little bit, they're able to manage because the bank does give them a good line. Is this really relevant for someone like that also? I think I think it is. I think it is. I think even people that bring home three hundred thousand uh, dollars a year, okay, let's say twenty five thousand dollars a month, should also make a budget. They should have a budget for everything that they do. Of course, they can allow themselves much more on all the different budget items that that I, okay, as a so called normal wage owner, or most people cannot allow themselves. So they can allow themselves uh, two thousand dollars for. I don't know, entertainment or dining out or whatever it is a month, but it still has to be budgeted. What What is, I don't see the wisdom in saying, well, the bank gives me a good line of credit. Well, that costs you money. If you can live without credit, why shouldn't you? And what about the lesson? Here we get into the whole educational side of things. What about the lesson for their children and so on? Is that, is that, is that the lesson they want to give their children, that it's okay to live beyond your means because the bank, the bank is nice to you or we'll just pull out from a, some other fund to cover it? I, I just feel that that um, good discipline and good good uh, teaching 
um, uh, negates negates that kind of behavior. Okay, so now let's focus on the other emergency fund that we were speaking about, the three to six month or six to 12 month emergency fund in right. case all hell breaks loose. Right, so uh, a couple of points to make about this. Um, it's recommended that one should put aside three to six months of uh, salary in an emergency fund for a case, for example, where there will be a significant uh, loss of salary for whatever reason, uh, disablement, um, somebody gets laid off, that sort of thing. So the, the, um, the tendency is uh, to go from three to six months depending on uh, the kind of expenses we are expected to have during that difficult period because there will be fixed expenses, the mortgage will still have to be paid and so on, but it's also we will have some control, for example, to reduce other things that we might have allowed, or allowed ourselves when a salary was coming in, so we're going to cut back. So we're not going to go out to eat now for until things straighten out and we're going to be very careful about how, what we spend on food and uh, those kind of things. And maybe we don't need to use the car as much because uh, dad doesn't have to go to work now. So we're going to be careful about the amount of fuel that we buy. So looking at, an, a, at that situation, they might be able to get by with 70 or 80 percent of what they normally spend on a uh, on a monthly uh, on a monthly basis, uh, but three to six months should be able to cover them for that period of time until until uh, the things get straightened out. He goes back to work or that sort of thing. So the alternative, obviously, is if you don't have anything like that put away, is very unpalatable. Where you're going to have to really really struggle and dig deep and maybe take out loans and and dip into savings that you might not want to uh, dip into and other funds that you've set away for the long term so uh, it's just a matter of protecting ourselves these monies three to six months and even the very short emergency fund that sit in these kind of funds that are that don't earn much interest that's okay because they're not there to earn interest they're there to protect you they're there to protect us from life's Inevitable emergencies. Everybody, almost, that I know at some point in life got laid off or got fired. Everybody in life, it happens two or three or four times a year, gets hit with a, a surprise expense of a repair or a dental bill or whatever it is that we so-called weren't ready for. Well, you should have been ready because that's life. We all live life. Emergencies happen, and, um, and we need to take the, the unexpected out of out of the equation and call everything expected okay uh, i think it, dave ramsey likes to say it will rain it will rain one day so get yourself a get yourself a raincoat ready at what point should an advisor tell his client that it's reasonable to be using some sort of borrowing mechanism to leverage himself up that's a very difficult question because i think it really depends on individual case if the goal is to live within our means and save for things that we that we that we want to buy rather than buying them on credit now and uh, paying the interest on it so in theory there's really no need ever to borrow money um, in a moment I'll talk about a mortgage which is a separate kind of a separate situation uh, but I understand also that that there can be cases for uh, for borrowing money uh, for legitimate goals for example education um, if uh, somebody is going off to school and, and uh, we don't have the money for, for reasons that are not relevant right now, money was not saved for a college student to go off to college, um, then if he wants to go to college, he's got he's to borrow money and take student loans. Um, if I don't have a car and buying a car will allow me to uh, work and make, make money, uh, then I may have to borrow money to buy the car. But again, one has to be very careful how much you borrow and what kind of car you buy. You buy a car to get you to or from work. You don't buy a car to show off to your friends. Uh, as far as tuition goes for a student loan, one also be careful. Perhaps you pick a school where um, the tuition is less uh, so that you don't come out of school with, with $200,000 in, uh, in loans. So these things have to be analyzed very, very carefully. And each, each uh, judge, each case judged on its own merits. 
there is justification for taking loans sometimes in the, I would say, for education and for, for being able to get to work. If somebody just wants to upgrade their cell phone and upgrade their television and that sort of thing, that's fine and dandy, but I don't believe one should take loans for that. I believe we should save first. Look at two scenarios. I don't have the money. I buy it now on 12 payments. I pay for 12 months, and I pay interest on top of that. And all, every month I'm looking at the bill, at the credit card bill, you know, looking at this at this uh, <laughs> scar on my record, so to speak, because I made a decision to buy something a few months ago, and just when will it end? And the other scenario is, why don't I just save the money now, put away money for 12 months, at the end of the 12 months, take out the cash, go buy it. I may even get a discount for cash, and I certainly won't pay interest. So, so. you differentiated between these sort of consumer disposable purchases and real estate. Absolutely. How, how do you see a mortgage? Okay, a mortgage, we need a house, okay? There are cases perhaps in the long run, depending on the rental terms and what kind of interest somebody can earn on his investments and, and stocks and so on, that it might pay to live in a rental for your whole life or much of your life. But there's also the psychological side of things that the families like to know that they own their own home. And uh, I, don't wanna, I don't want to get too much into uh, market uh, difficulties and fluctuations of things that are going on today. But classically, classically, uh, you needed some money for a down payment and uh, be able to afford the monthly mortgage payment over the course of the 15, 20, 25 years. And so one has to look very carefully at how am I going to be able to pay the mortgage. This really touches also on your example before, what kind of a house to uh, allow yourself to afford. And sometimes even an extra room uh, can make a difference of several uh, good dollars, a hundred, two hundred dollars in a mortgage payment each month, which people sometimes don't understand. That's not one month. You're going to do that now for the next 15 or 20, 25 years. And ob obviously also to go for fixed rate as much as possible. Um, I'm not a mortgage, mortgage expert myself, but look for stability. Fixed mortgage as quickly as you can pay it off. As, in other words, a shorter term as possible. And Buy what you need, not what you want. Buy the house that will serve your needs. You don't buy a house with an extra room and an extra deck and that sort of thing uh, just because it looks nice or because you want to impress somebody. you got to live within your budget. And generally also uh, counselors, uh, budget advisors say that one should not pay more than 25% of his monthly income, take-home income, on the mortgage. Some say that includes property taxes. Some say it doesn't, but that's the ballpark figure. Okay, so we're getting the sense in talking about borrowing that for things that are an investment in yourself, for example, education would be something you would advise, or in the event of buying a home, using a mortgage is a reasonable tool, and it's not something that as a budget counselor you come out against saying you better okay. save up for your house and pay cash mm -hmm. for it. No, that some people will, will never get there then. And you have to also consider, you know, you, when you're in your late 20s, early 30s at the latest, and you're raising children, and you want your children to have a nice environment, and you want to live in a nice neighborhood. So it's not practical to wait until you have the care. Some people may never get there, and if they get there when they're 50 years old, that didn't, that didn't serve the children and the family very well. Let's focus on savings. As a financial planner, when I put together a plan for someone, I, I always tell them that my job is to tell you how much money you need to be saving on a monthly basis in order to achieve your long-term goals. How you save that money, however, is something that you have to work out yourself, meaning I'm not going to get involved in all the ins and outs of your daily life. But as a budget advisor, you do help them with that. Well, of course, I, I emphasize the necessity of putting into the budget an item called savings. Just as there's an item called items called food and gasoline for the car and mortgage and all the other things we've been discussing, there has to be a line item called savings. And it sh that certainly should be some sort of automatic bank transfer, hopefully on payday. 
So if you get paid the first of the month, it should come out on the day that you're paid. And uh, following the rule of pay yourself first. The first bill to pay during the month, you should pay yourself. That is to say, put away the money in the savings. Many, many times I've discovered for myself and in, in case of clients, when you do that, you don't even feel the money is missing. You don't say at the end of the month, oh, where's that Where's that $300 I put away in savings? I really could use it. You know, we don't think like that because you have such a satisfaction and a good feeling knowing that you've you put away the money for, uh, at this level of our discussion, for some unspecified long-term purpose. So uh, let's those- divide up between short, medium, and long-term goals. When someone's beginning to put aside the money, do you recommend that he start by putting aside for the short or the long or the medium-term goals? Well, I think you need to put away for everything. Short-term goal would be, for example, suppose you need to replace uh, replace an appliance in the house uh, that you know is going at, at some point. And by the way, I'm not sure that this necessarily touches on the emergency fund. An emergency fund would be if the washing machine breaks and you need to fix it. But if I know that my washing machine is uh, X number of years old and it's just going to go in a year or two, so I can save for that. I can put away uh, a couple hundred dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month for a year or two and I'll have mostly what I need to buy the washing machine. So that's short term. Medium term, medium term I would characterize as um, goals for the family, um, education for the children, special um, tutorial and the workshop kind of programs for the children that perhaps I want to give them music lessons. Uh, I have a, I have a two or three year old. I want to start saving for those kind of things for the child. Uh, uh, family celebrations um, that uh, some 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 sort of a confirmation or bar mitzvah project or something that I know uh, down the road uh, my son or daughter is going to have. I always like to tell the story of the couple that came to me uh, when they were, uh, the son was 12 and a half years old and said, uh, this, our son's bar mitzvah just kind of fell on us. As if to say they didn't know for 12 and a half years that uh, ago when he was born that they would want to make a bar mitzvah party for him. So this kind of that's sort of the medium term, the long term, uh, medium. I don't want to put a def- definite line between medium and long term, but they sort of overlap. But the kind of life experiences we're talking about and life events, as celebrations for the family, tuition for the children as needed, certainly college savings, wedding, and perhaps having something to help a child with and a down payment for a property when the time comes. That's certainly medium to long and. I, of course, the classic uh, example of long term would be uh, saving for retirement, because we know uh, already, certainly living in the uh, in the Western world as we are now, with what's going on with Social Security and uh, other retirement programs, programs and so on. If we want to maintain the same level of uh, a standard of living when we retire that we um, that we have while we're thriving in our work life, we're going to need probably more money than, uh, than Social Security together with our retirement accounts is going to grant us at that age. So anything that can be saved for the very long term um, is important. I would also emphasize that there's a fallacy that people think that when you retire, you don't need as much money as um, as you do when you're uh, in the prime of life, so to speak. I was giving a seminar once, which I had all ages there. I had young people in their 20s, and I had retirees there about 70 years old. And I talked about the importance of these kind of savings and saving for retirement. And uh, a young couple got up and said, oh, why, why, what's the problem? When you're retired, you don't need as much money. And I had this 70-year-old couple stand up and said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. There's so <laughs> many things you want to do. And you want to give to your children and help them and your grandchildren and you want to travel. Well, you still don't need to eat and you don't need to pay electricity. Okay, maybe your house is paid off, maybe not. But if you want to take care of yourself, and not to mention, of course, all the kinds of health costs and medical costs that people have as they get older. So you need to to plan for your whole life. Let's drill down a little bit more into the savings strategies We've been talking about cash flow management, about budgeting, about planning for an emergency fund. We've spoken a little bit about debt management. 
And now we've really been discussing the importance of savings, but if you want to tell your client how to save, how he can develop a strategy, what's the best way to do that? I think I referred to the fact that it has to be done as a reflex, as, a, as, a, as an instinct on a, on a regular monthly basis. And uh, putting that into the budget and having the money come out into one or two or three different funds, depending on, on uh, what your, what your uh, ter- uh, long-term goals are. And it's just to do it without thinking. I, I also should say that, uh, that I've also discovered that if families that are, if you will, on a good track and are organized, it's a classic example that if you uh, have some nice little uh, tidbit of food that's very tasty to you or a little bit of wine, suddenly you develop an appetite for more. And I've discovered that with savings, this is the same thing. Once people learn that they can get by with less and can allocate more towards savings and towards uh, worrying and taking care of their, of their future, they sort of feed on this and find more and more ways to be frugal and, uh, and save more. An example of this, for example, when, when people who have no food budget, and we get them on a food budget, and let's say, as my previous example, $1,000 a month, uh, they'll discover that they don't need even $1,000 a month. They need just 800 And so now they suddenly have $200 more to do something else with. So when you get in the groove, It's just like getting in shape, whether it's exercise or dieting or anything else. Once you get in the groove, you feed on yourself, on your success, on your good feelings, on your motivation, and and you're able to do better and better all the time. Okay. David, we're beginning to to run out of our time in this class. I, I just want to go back to something so that we can leave people with a little bit of a specific number or maybe I, to clarify regarding debt management as a financial planner and putting together a financial plan one of the things that I tend to look for the most is cash flow and in theory if a person has debt but he's able to cash flow the debt it, it doesn't necessarily negatively impact his long-term financial plan however it could certainly mess up his budget I, I just want to be very clear about what you said you felt that as far as the the ratio of debt that a person should have regarding his housing you said about 25 percent or maximum 25 percent of monthly cash flow could go towards housing that's i assume for rent and or mortgage Mm -hmm. and for consumer debt you really feel zero is the amount that we should be advising is that correct yeah the goal should be to have no debt Again, leaving aside the the mortgage, uh, the mortgage payment, the goal should be to have no debt. If we are responsible, then we can live on no debt because responsibility also means that I will spend what I earn and not more. Now, one person will earn forty thousand dollars a year. One will earn eighty. One will earn two hundred. Each has to build his life around that income so that he doesn't uh, spend more than he makes. And there are many, many people who do just fine with less money and are even quite content with their lot, knowing that they're able to manage their lives at that level and don't need more and don't want more and don't want to be tempted with more. So yes, 0% is, uh, is the goal. Naturally, when we begin at first to sit down with clients, many of them have debt. So zero cannot be the immediate goal. And in that respect, we have to build a budget where almost all of our energy goes into reducing the debt, bringing it to zero, which can take a number of months or even maybe longer until we reach the zero. And at that point, we really can turn a corner and take all the money that was going to debt and put it to other things such as the savings. Okay, that sounds like very wise advice. It's certainly something that we have to all talk to clients about in terms of if you ultimately want to build wealth, you, you have to have a positive number in your bank account. And the, the longer you keep debt, the, the longer it's going to be until you can start actually building up a real nest egg for, for building wealth. Right, right. So David Litke, I would like to thank you again. David Litke runs a budgeting Uh, consulting firm called Bonus Family Budget Counseling. It's been very informative, and I hope that we'll get a chance to talk again soon. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed speaking to you. 
Thank you for joining us for this continuing education class. If you have questions regarding the materials, please feel free to email the instructor, Doug Goldstein, at doug at profile-financial.com. Now, in order to get your CFP continuing education credit, please return to our website to complete the required exam, www.ce-institute.com.